This is Patrick from WSOU 89.5 FM, the loudest rock, and I am here with Corey from Norma Jean. How are you doing today? Doing good, man. Doing really good. Stoked to be here. Yeah, stoked to have you here. Uh, really digging the new album, so this is uh, it's going to be fun. So your new album, Death Rattle Sing For Me, is out now. It's been out for a few months now. Uh, the first taste we got of this album over the summer was the song Call For The Blood. I know Matthew said this song kind of established the album's theme. When did this song begin? Where did it start? It really began with Matt and Grayson meeting in the studio while we were doing demoing. Um, at the very beginning of this, we, we had some random demos we were archiving. And then Grayson just went to Matt's home studio and just laid down a bunch of riffs. Like, here's a bunch of ideas. And the way Matt works is he's not just going to sit on that. He took that and all those ideas and made a song into it. So there's a lot of editing going on. And he made this demo out of it because he doesn't play guitar, really. So he just worked it in, put some drums to it. And and then we went back and learned, kind of relearned what he did because he did some stretching and some slowing down. So the riffs aren't anything like what originally they were. And it just, it made this really interesting sound. Um, and we just kind of mimicked it. And th the record as a whole has a lot of uh, weird experimentations kind of stuff like that. So we felt like it was a good song to start with because typically you, you put a song out and that's kind of, you're giving an idea of what the record is as a whole, or that's what kind of people might take from a first single. So we knew the song was kind of a, a weird song, but it, it's exactly what it, it's supposed to be. And we just thought it would, you know, we, we really liked the reaction being kind of a little bit of confusion and and I think that really set a, a precedent for now we can just release whatever we want and it'll work. And you'll kind of know what is behind the scenes as well, like the deep track kind of stuff. Yeah, the, the album is very experimental. And you just said how the initial reaction was a, a little bit of confusion because it's not what people expect from Norma Jean. But when uh, when Matt first showed you guys the songs and um, when he first showed you guys Call for the Blood and what he did and how he manipulated the guitar sounds and stuff, what were you expecting? What was your reaction? Like, were you expecting a classic sounding Norma Jean song? Were you expecting what it turned out to be? What uh, What was your reaction? Uh, well, I, I'm I'm here. When I first heard it, I was, you know, thinking, well, this is a demo. You know, I don't. And, but I mean, my reaction was probably the same as maybe some of our fans, because I was a little bit confused. I didn't know what I was going to sing on this until almost time to go into the studio. And it just kind of hit me because I was trying to, I, I was thinking of it more like a, you know, like a slowed down punk vibe. And I was doing a lot of like wordy kind of yelling stuff. And then I heard the, the, that singing part, because it's all in that same note range too. It doesn't really, it, it doesn't transform into another like melodic section or anything. It, it's almost like the song is one big build up, and then it stops. So, and then, and that song bleeds into um, Spearmint Revolt on the record. They they go together. So it, it's kind of like a build up into that song. Um, it's it's almost like a teaser song in a way I, and I, I think once I realized that's what it was it it was a lot easier to figure out but yeah it was confusing but I liked the challenge of it it was it was good to break out and, and not just hear you know a, a basic you know verse chorus verse chorus structure um, so it was a really interesting way to write a song and um, and it's just the beginnings of new ideas and experiment you know, how to write, structure a song. And I think it's something that we'll mess with some more and, you know, bring it in a little more, see what happens with it. Yeah, definitely. And the lyrics on this album and the vocal performance, particularly with Call for the Blood and Spearmint Revolt, they're very intense. Uh, where did the lyrical inspiration come from for this album? It kind of, whenever I look back at the lyrics, it, it's almost like every line could have its own explanation so it's kind of hard to put it all into one thing but you know we were we were just 
you know, it was pandemic times. So we were locked down. We're kind of isolated and, and we've done isolated records before, but we kind of forced the isolation on ourselves. Like when we did Polar Similar, we went to um, Pachyderm Studio, which is in the middle of nowhere. And, you know, we were trying to do the, the isolated record thing. Um, but this was a different kind of isolation where, you know, I think every band now has, if you, any band wrote music during this time, which most bands did, they, they have officially done their isolation record. I think what we found is that we went more into our, the idea is to get away from your influences, but we actually found ourselves digging into all of our influences and seeing them more for what they were. But lyrically, it's just, it comes from a place of like, just a very desperate kind of feeling that we, that we were having at the time. And, and we just put it into the record. It was, it was a lot of our old school influences came in and, and when we got into music, it was, it was all about putting ha what you were thinking, maybe something I can't necessarily put into words here, but we could put it into the music and that's how we all started getting into music. And I think that, that is, is really what, what ended up happening. It was, it was, it was very um, organic kind of feeling. Um, it's hard to explain, but it was just intense. It was a very intense feeling. And that was the engine that drove the record. I mean, we wrote 40 songs for this record and we picked what, 12. So we were very, very motivated. Of course. And, uh, you know, Norma Jean has been around for a long time, over 20 years now. And the band's sound has obviously evolved up until this point. But you just talked about how um, this was uh, your second isolation record. How did recording during the pandemic kind of um, impact the sound and the, the vibe while recording? Um, it, like I said, it just really made us look into what the reasons why we got into music in the first place. Cause we, we didn't, we were not planning on writing a record. All hail had just come out. Um, we had a whole year of touring planned and all of that went away. So, you know, we were at, at the very beginning, it was kind of like, you know, this might not last that long, but let's use our time wisely and start writing some stuff. And you know, then that, you know, two weeks turns into a month and month turns into six and it just, it went on and on. So we, it didn't stop. So neither did we. And that's, that's why we ended up with 40 songs. We were just kind of waiting for everything to kind of end. And I think, you know, having that short time, shorter goal motivated us, motivated us more to, to write faster, to write more efficiently and ended up making it, you know, uh, we ended up just having a lot more to work with. So I think that's even something that we learned from, from all of that is we can, you know, we should set shorter goals for ourselves and not just think, Oh, we got all the time in the world. And so that was really an interesting take from it all too. I'm sure I could think, I'll probably think of like five other things to talk about with, with this later. Like, Oh yeah, I should have, should have said that. But you know, it's, it's at this point, it's, it's out now and it's kind of hard to remember exactly how we were feeling at the time. It's, it's all on the record, you know? Yeah, definitely. And um, I know you said that all hail had just come out before you had put this album out, but to me, this album does sound like uh, the best of your past few albums all kind of put into one, you know, it's very experimental kind of like wrongdoers and polar similar, which you just said was also an isolation album, but it's got some, classic hardcore heaviness like all hail uh, i'm curious do you guys ever listen to your own music when writing an album because i'm thinking to myself well this sounds like it's very norma jean influenced when i'm mm -hmm. listening to it yeah i i i love that too that it because there's you know especially like with a song like call for the blood you know ends up sounding like norma jean somehow and I, I, we really like that, but yeah, we listen to our own music all the time. We, we love it. We love every, everything we've done and we, we really compete with ourselves too. So we were competing with all hail and, and uh, polar similar, you know, the, the more recent records that we had done. And um, it's not more like we're 
not so much where we're listening to it and saying, how can we beat that? You know, we know the songs. Um, I, I think with the way we write now, it, it is a lot of home demoing and bringing it together. Whereas, you know, before every, every record was just meeting in, in this room and playing as a band. So this was a different way to do things to where we didn't even know what these songs were until we played them live together. Then we heard where all these changes would need to happen. And, um, it, you know, kind of seeing the record kind of outside looking in perspective, I think was really important for us with this record. Cause up until it came out, we were all questioning, what is this thing? And so I think that's a really important thing too. And a really important lesson for us was, hearing the record through other people's ears there's something to that there's something to be said about what happens there because if you if you're even if we're working and I'm working by myself it's almost like I can't do it but if anyone else is in the room I mean it could be I don't know the mailman or something <laughs> like hey here's a package for you like and I'm working in the middle like hearing anything you're doing through someone someone else's ears you hear it different. And so, you know, being in that isolated state, we were confused and, and like, is this even good? I don't know. Let's just, let's just see what happens with it. But I'm, we're just really happy that everyone loved it. It, I, you know, we, we do like to think of our fans when we write, we want to write stuff that they'll like. We want to, you know, we're writing stuff that we like, but with this record, it, it was, completely cut off from all that stuff and in a much more real way so um we were definitely thinking about ourselves <laughs> more than anything with this and uh, you know it, it turned out really cool it's it's a it's a brutal record there's um it's it's all all the sounds are real too we didn't do any replacement tricks or anything that that's exactly how we played it it's in a very live feeling to it yeah, it definitely sounds like that. And I know you said that you like to treat every song as a draft. Now, I'm curious what that means. Like if you want to use uh, Spearmint Revolt, for example, like that was inspired by Call for the Blood. How, when you were recording and writing Spearmint Revolt, how did you kind of treat it as a draft? Uh, the, that comes from the Cult of Dunn Manifesto. I, I recommend anyone that does any kind of creating to look this up. It's it's been around for a very long time and it's something that I've followed for decades now. And the idea is that there is no editing phase. When you make a change, you've now made a new thing. It, the old thing is gone. That, that song is now, you know, essentially abandoned and you've created a new song, even with just the, the slightest change. So, so you accept it as a draft, um, but at the same time, any edit makes a new thing. So that's kind of what, what it, that comes from. And it just helps you to get things done because you don't, you don't overthink it really. You, you go, we, we pretty much go until the energy stops and then we abandon it for, for the time being. And we'll move on to something else We're, we don't want to force anything in, into the song or force the song to be anything, you know, cause that, I think that comes across. I think people can tell when you, try to force a song out or like, you know, when you, you hear the band that, that tried to write the radio song, like, let's just try to get on the radio. You could tell that's what they were doing. And you don't want that. You want it to feel natural. Some bands still pull that off really well and, and write great stuff. And I wish I could have a little bit of that, but I think for us, when we, whenever we've tried to force something into a song, whether it, no matter what it is, it, it just, we can tell. And then we ended up not liking it. At the end of the day, we're going to end up not liking anything that we do. It just kind of happens or, or maybe we're just sick of it by the end of it. You know, we played it so many times. Yeah, but the record does sound very natural, like nothing sounds out of place. And uh, even a song, which I'm very curious about, like a killing word, uh, you know, songs like Call for the Blood and Spearmint Revolt, they're a little more melodic, a little slower punk, like you said. But, you know, killing word is super heavy, very classic Norma Jean heavy sound. And I know you said Call for the Blood set the tone for this record, but I'm curious how this song began because it's almost the opposite sounding musically. Yeah, the, um, that song is purposefully kind of in, in a way almost a tribute 
to that, you know, kind of classic metal core. Like I wanted to write a metal core song, like straight, straight up. Like that's what this is, you know? And we put the long bridge in there that actually happened in the studio. Jeremy did that. He was like, I want something here. Like a moment is what he called it. He just took the track and, and went, you know, cut it and went and just made this space. And we had no idea what to put there. And he just started doing some, you know, synthy thing. He had, a, he has a modular synth, which if anybody look up a modular synth, it's crazy. Yeah. Cause it, they'll take up a whole room. Uh, uh, Trent Reznor has probably the biggest modular synth. It's an, it's an entire room and yeah. you're like plugging things in and you, you send a signal through it and it kind of does what it's going to do. You can't really control it. And that's all like a piano synth is, is you're sending a signal through a series of things and it, it, it's a curated sound, but this is, you have to make it happen on your own. So we use a lot that on, once he showed us that he, he had, his big portable one that he brought we use that a bunch on the record too but yeah so you know there's a little bit of experimentation there but for the most part even structurally that song was meant to be like classic metal core kind of thing and it was just fun like we just you know like we want to experiment be artists and all that kind of stuff but we also want to have a lot of fun and to us that that's what that was and two of the main riffs from that song the the verse riff and the very, very end riff were old riffs, things that I wrote in 2009 and 10, um, which is, you know, before Meridional came out. And um, I, there, was, I, I, there wasn't a way to use those because, you know, for the end, it had to have that double kick part. There was no way to change that. And we needed someone who could do it. Um, Matt Marquez pulled it off no no problem so it's like oh cool we can use this finally and so you know what's kind of cool thing too where it's not just a tribute to kind of old classic norma jean sound it literally is old you know over a decade old um riffs that that were put into it yeah and i'm hearing a lot about that with albums that are coming out now a lot of a lot of people are saying uh, oh that was a riff that I've been sitting on for 10 years and now it's made it onto this album in 2022. Do you think, um, like I said, Norma Jean, they've been around for over 20 years. Do you think uh, the evolution of the band sound kind of leads you to be able to use these different ideas that you've had throughout your whole career? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I just like, I use my phone, I'll just hum things into it. And I always say that I'll write 100 riffs and trash 99 of them because the way i write at least um grayson's a lot different he's he's a a riff a second <laughs> he's constantly having ideas and he can just do anything um i'll pick one thing and that'll be the basis of an entire song and but then you know there's all that stuff left over and then when it's time to do something new i'll go back into it i mean even on this record um matthew found a tape like cassette tape of, of the way i used to record all my riffs was just on a little cassette recorder um actually di recording digital messed that up because we we're not archiving properly and we lot we lose all this digital information but the tapes are still there so he digitized that we we actually pulled riffs from that we found old like lost Norma Jean songs on there, um, like pre Oh God, the aftermath probably should have been on that record. So, you know, 2004, 2005. And um, so, yeah, we'll, we'll, you know, it doesn't, there's no age limit to some of that stuff. Cause it, it, you'll, you'll hear it different later, you know, or, and, you know, I, I've completely forgotten about this part. So it becomes new again. And, there's kind of something kind of exciting about that. So yeah, we'll, we'll dig up anything. Anything works as inspiration for, for a Norma Jean song. Yeah, for sure. And I know you said before hearing a song through someone else's ears, like completely changes it. What was it like in 2022 hearing songs that you've recorded on tape almost 20 years ago when you're sitting down to make a new album? Uh, it's almost like, 
there, there's some p- times when I'm, I'm hearing some of that stuff and I'm thinking, is that even me? But then a lot of it comes rushing back like, oh, yeah, I remember that. I remember this. I, I, I totally remember this idea. And it, that's another thing, too, when you start writing a song and, you know, you go through that, you know, I guess editing phase, I'll call it that. But you you change it into this new song. I guess this kind of proves that idea because then when you go back and even just listen to how that song began, you'll find things that you want to bring back into it or and if you don't do that you hear it like again like 10 years later um you'll the i i feel like the same thing kind of happens where you're like oh we should have kept that i don't know why we didn't um i i find that happens a lot especially when i'm hearing us you know we're recording something to tape from a live performance just you know in the practice space and way cooler things happen right when you wrote the song for the first time like that's that's usually the best version of the song and then when you go to record it you're just trying to mimic that and which is impossible so um we started when we we would practice we just mic up everything and that becomes our demo and then we literally bring the demo into the session that's this is something new for death rattle sing for me we we literally brought the demo into the session. And so that was our click track. You know, that was what we were, we were literally overdubbing the literal demo so that we would keep it as much as the original as possible. Um, Not every song, but for the most part, that's what it is. The demo is behind there. It's probably in the track. If Jeremy pulls it up, it's like, Oh yeah, here's the demo. So that that's a really cool way to do it. I think. Yeah, definitely. And something I do want to come back to that I'm curious about is the modular synth. Because, yeah, I have seen a modular synth before. And as a guitar player, it scares the crap out of me because, you know, yeah. you've, got, you've got like two knobs and a switch. This thing is like, you know, I don't even know how many wires and plugs and stuff. It's ridiculous. Like, what, what was your first reaction to seeing Norma Jean music being made on this giant thing after uh, recording on tape 20 years ago? I, I remember Jeremy trying to explain what it does and how it works because you can add elements to it like well yeah i'm i'm building a thing i'm gonna put this in there i'm like what are you talking about like it kind of looks like a like the his version he had a portable one so he could bring it because a lot of them are pretty stationary especially when you get using the really old gear these things are end up with these giant really old you know it's a synthesizer is what it is but people imagine the piano you know the synthesizer um that's a it it's kind of the same thing but not um and so there was one point where you know he had sent a signal through this thing and pushed record and he just let it play and i think we left the room we might have even gone and got food across the street and just let it run and we came back and it was playing a completely different thing from when we started and it's it's not unlike if you like play guitar through uh you know a totally you know turned up delay pedal and you just let it go for a while it turns into feedback and the feedback gets weirder and weirder as you as you go it's kind of like that except it it's every piece is functioning in its own different way so you can't have a delay you if you want it, it'll add a beat to it it's really strange i don't i don't it's it's kind of like it's a little ai yeah. um but oh man I, I we ended up wanting to do so much and you know and jeremy would just be playing with dude hit record because it's doing something cool it's like dude this if this is the whole time it's gonna do this like we'll we'll fill up our hard drive with this so it was just a really fun new instrument to have for us i know it's not a new idea at all but for us it was a very new experience and and just fun to to mess with yeah for sure and um i gotta ask you what are you most happy with how this album turned out uh the thing i'm happiest about is that people like it that our fans like it because i mean we were just 
especially even knowing that we were going to put call for the blood out first. It's like, this is the weirdest song on the record. And it, I, that was such a good tension breaker to, to get that song out. And, and once we saw the reactions come back, like, okay, I, I think I even saw one headline say like Norma Jean releases a really weird song <laughs> and it didn't hurt our feelings. So that was a good, a good feeling that, it's like, yeah, even if it's that, like we're, we're happy with, with that people do like it. And if anyone doesn't understand it, that's okay too. Um, and, and that's, that's always been a thing for us that keeps our, our morale high is we have fans that, you know, our favorite bands put out a record and that's our favorite record in the world. And then the next one comes out and we're like, I don't like this one as much. But I'm still a fan because I like the one before and that's okay to do. You don't have to like everything a band does. You don't have to like everything we do. It's not required. It's not like, you know, we're, we, we require, um, uh, what's the word? Like loyalty to everything we do. Cause if, if we, if we put out, if we record it all the time, it would be a constant, you would hear literally everything we make. And you can't like everything. So that's, yeah. So that's the thing that I'm the happiest about. People do like it and they hear the experience as a whole, listening to the record from front to back as, as it's meant to be. And there's a, there's a story there and um, there's a vibe to it. And we, we tried to put that even into the artwork with, with the water and the surfing surfer levitation girl. And that is should be what you envision when you listen to it. Yeah, definitely hear all of that. Uh, Norma Jean, Death Rattle Sing For Me, out now. Go stream it, download it, get the vinyl, CD, whatever you got to do. Uh, Corey, is there anything else you want to add? Well, no, man. Uh, we're we're playing some shows coming up. We got the uh, Christmas Burns Red show in Lancaster. Really excited about that. To be a part of that, we'll be announcing some tours soon, and we'll see you in 2023. We'll be on tour. All right, fantastic. Corey, thank you so much. Norma Jean, this is Patrick, WSOU 89.5.